Uh, thank you very much, and it's a great uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I've got two hats um, that I'm wearing. Uh, I'll demonstrably uh, flip them uh, so that you know uh, uh, which one I'm wearing when I'm saying what I'm saying. Uh, but I want to start off just with a bit of context. Um, I've been in public service for around 35 years, and about 30 of those have been in the regeneration uh, uh, game, dealing with issues of land, dealing with uh, issues of economic growth, economic challenge over that time. Um, I think I'm most proud of um, in terms of disruptive thinking and uh, disruptive behaviour in order to make a change in the work that we did as British Waterways and subsequently as Scottish Canals, taking something that were remnant assets of yesterday's economy, yesterday's industrial age, and turning them into something that was productive and worthwhile for the communities of today. And we did that not just by the symbolism of creating uh, giant horses' heads next to the, uh, uh, the motorway and sewage station out in Grangemouth, but actually more pleasing for me was uh, using the canals uh, for uh, strategic water management in North Glasgow that in doing so changed the economic fortunes of a quarter of the city, beginning to change how land could be remediated, uh, how it could be prevented from flooding, and there's a direct correlation between areas that flood and weak uh, uh, economic uh, uh, prospects. And therefore, using yesterday's infrastructure for tomorrow's purpose was something that I was uh, really uh, uh, pleased to be part of. And therefore, when I took on Scottish Enterprise, and I'll talk about that in a moment, I also took on the chair of the Vacant and Derelict Land um, uh, uh, Task Force. I was stalked, I have to say. There was uh, no chance of saying no to that gig. Thank you, Martin Valenti, and to other colleagues for doing that. But it seemed to me someone uh, from my professional background and someone who grew up next to vacant and derelict land, it was something for me that I felt was just an absolute injustice. And, it's, and Cabinet Secretary said it wasn't good enough. I think it's a shame, a, a shame on us having 11,500 hectares across Scotland, largely 80% uh, being uh, derelict, abandoned in close to and around all our, our communities. It's simply not good enough. And for me, when we looked into that, it was a function of failure of system, but actually a failure of culture. And that's not good enough. We have to do much better, and we have to do much better more quickly. And for me, looking at the, the, the Scottish canals and the British waterways uh, um, experience, it seems entirely possible to me, in fact, expected of us, that if we take an enterprising approach to see those as land assets and not problems, that we will come up with solutions. So as a vacant and derelict land task force, we've tried to organise the data, we first of all started to bring to life the vacant and derelict land register that's obscure, hidden away, very difficult to get to. We've cleansed it and we will bring it to life throughout this year. We'll make it accessible. In making it accessible, making it clear, we'll begin to articulate all those different land parcels in a way that's understandable to everyone. So it's not for specialists, it's for people who can actually access it and understand it. And we'll create bundles of land that have the same characteristics. We'll then begin to, throughout this year, pilot approaches that will unlock the economic potential of that land and present a range of options that will fit the challenges that each of those parcels of land present. And underpinning of all, all of that is about productive use, but locally determined productive use, not administered from on high, but actually engaging because that's another lesson for me uh, through uh, uh, British Waterways and all my history is taking communities and, and, and people with you. So as we get the, the, the vacant derelict land uh, register sorted, we make it visible, we organise it in a way that's understandable, and we begin to pilot different methodologies of bringing it to life, then we'll begin to make a change. So I would encourage all of you to take interest in this, there is a broad church, and thank you to all those colleagues who have joined that task force. There is a broad church and incredible passion to do something special there, and that's what we intend to do. And I'd like this audience for you to participate in that, connect to it, be part of it, help us transform those assets. So to Scottish Enterprise, if my background was around converting um, uh, communities uh, and assets in, uh, into productive use and, and stimulating economy, then I was surprised, if not frustrated, a little, 
uh, uh, when I was in British Waterways that I could not get the support from Scottish Enterprise to help in things like unlocking North Glasgow. It simply wasn't their focus, and I am not criticising the focus. The focus of Scottish Enterprise was to focus on businesses that could or had scaled, or to focus on sectors. And that was right. That was a decision made 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago, some time uh, ago. In making that decision and providing that focus, which had great results, it left behind certain issues. It left behind our capabilities and organisation to participate in place. So we had regional economic development agencies all over, spread all over Scotland. But we centralised those and we focused our energy, our people and our money on those businesses and those companies and in those sectors. But we left behind place and we left behind relationships. So when I joined 18 months ago and talked to our staff and talked to our stakeholders and talked to government, it was clear to me that we had to revisit that. Because government demand of us, rightly, that not just Scottish Enterprise, but colleagues in the room from Highlands and Islands, folks here who may be here from the Emerging Partnership of the South of Scotland, or from Skills Development Scotland, or the Scottish Funding Council, that family of organisations that spend almost £2 billion a year on economic development, stimulating economic growth, we're not functioning as a team, not functioning as a system. So my first job, was to bring us into that family and help and assist that, that, that become a family that would function as a system. But that's only part of it. We've had to go beyond that, necessarily go beyond that, to partnering with Transport Scotland, partnering with uh, SEPA, and we'll speak more about this in, 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 a, in a few minutes. So this is a whole systematic approach to how we begin to challenge ourselves about tackling some of the issues of the day. And this is one of the central issues of the day. So in doing that, we've reorganised ourselves as an organisation. I'd be delighted if you take away our Building Scotland's Future Together, our strategy, our strategic framework, a three-year outlook, a one-year plan, and behind that, an all-bets-off plan if Brexit happens. I'll, I'll say a bit about that. But that framework begins to prioritise key issues that really begin for us to recognise that Scottish enterprise has a place and not just helping those stimulate hot parts of the economy, but our people and our resources and our assets need to be stimulating the cold parts of Scotland's economy. And there are too many cold parts of Scotland's economy. And as the Cabinet Secretary said, we're in it because we're an economic development agency, but actually we've got 2,800 acres of land across Scotland. And for the last 12 years, we've used that land to sell, to help balance, to help uh, leverage uh, um, uh, capital receipts in order to put into other activity. Well, I want us as an organisation to look at that land as assets and for us to own that, to partner with those assets, to create value from those assets and with the creation of that value, to recycle that value into the economy. So I want us to be active with our land base as well as helping others with strategic land bases. Now, there are three things that Scottish Enterprise will now focus on going forward. One is international, one is national, and one is uh, uh, supporting um, uh, business growth. The international bit is important to this agenda. And that little story that the Cabinet Secretary talked about, Malta, is not... We have a capability of what we are doing as a small country to export our thinking, our IP, our capability. But also, as Scotland, in our international agenda, and Scottish uh, Development International is part of Scottish Enterprise, now fully folded into uh, Scottish Enterprise, our job is to attract foreign direct investment into Scotland. And outside of London, Scotland is the most successful place in the UK for attracting external investment into the country. I want us to begin to target that inward investment to this opportunity. And we'll say more about that and how we'll do it. We also uh, stimulate exporting, and that's really important to us. And there's two things that we are going to, and we, we've been doing that for a while, but there are two things that we want to begin to do that we haven't been focusing on tremendously in the past. One is around capital, attracting financial capital to Scotland, but also human capital to Scotland. 
People, all the businesses we talk to and communities we talk to are worried about holding on to talent in Scotland, about losing it due to all of this economic uncertainty. I don't know if you noticed back in March, but we launched a love affair with Europe campaign under the Scotland is Now banner. We told Europe that we love them. We told the businesses and investors who invest here and employ here that we love them. And we deliberately used that language to demonstrate our humanity, our openness, our welcoming conditions. And we must, must do more of that. Because we want the very best talent. And believe you, me, the young people we speak to wherever and we've got 30 offices around the world under the SDI banner. Young people are looking to find where they're going to live and bring up their families. And the type of places they are choosing to study, to invest, to be employed, are places that have values around environment, values around education, values around fair work principles. Those things are, are now distinguishing us. And therefore, this agenda about how we deal with place, how we deal with environment, how we deal with converting broken assets of yesterday into assets of tomorrow matters. When we are attracting international businesses like Barclays, who are creating about 6,000 jobs in Glasgow, it wasn't the cash incentives and the RSA and all those things that matter. It's what's the place that we are creating for the employees, for the families, for the sense of community, for the sense of place. That's what will distinguish us going forward. The second pillar that we'll focus on is, is an economic growth at a regional level. And that's why I'm particularly interested in what the Cabinet Secretary was talking about, regional partnerships for this agenda. Scotland today has now complete coverage of economic, regional economic partnerships. I would like to see coterminicity, a joining up of these partnerships we're talking about in this agenda with those partnerships. Because for me, each of those regional partnerships now are building, and we want to help, and we will help, create investment prospectuses for each of those regions that are predicated on the economic advantages that each region has. And we know that our land and the quality of our land is part of every region's offer. So I want us to be working with those regional partnerships, articulating investment prospectuses that create a sense of inclusive growth and place, and therefore land must be part of that agenda. And that is not just from a, an enterprise perspective. The whole community, this family, this system, and talking to SEPA and colleagues there, SEPA, you know, Terry will say, SEPA is now an economic development agency. I love that. Because for all the incentives we can put in to attracting a company, SEPA can easily say no if it says yes. And it creates the conditions where those investors are welcomed to do purposeful investment, purposeful investment, then we can distinguish ourselves. The final pillar that we get involved in is around business continuity and business growth. And we're creating a national investment bank at the moment. It'll open doors in the middle of uh, next year. We have the Scottish Investment Bank now under Scottish Enterprise, but that will be built on and created and stimulated and grow. And it will be mission-led. There will be three missions that that bank will focus on. One will be around digital and data. The main thing will be around carbon. Next to that will be place. And therefore, this community, these regional partnerships must face in to these challenges because none of this is, and this is not a grant, a handout agenda. This has to be an investment in agenda. And therefore, this community needs to begin to organize itself in order to play into that world. And Scottish Enterprise will help with that. And my final comments, given where we are, with all this economic disruption, we have to focus on three other pillars. One is around resilience. How do we help communities and businesses of today survive and, and cope with all this economic disruption? 
and we are building capacity and capability to make sure we are able to deploy our people and our money and resources into helping cope with whatever shocks come. But we can't stay in that space forever. We have to begin to help those companies, those communities begin to grow again, be able to recover and then grow. And then the third pillar is around restructuring Scotland's economy. We need to face in and make sure we are placing enough emphasis on tomorrow's economy. And in doing so, begin to look at those things through two filters. One is inclusive growth, and you've heard about that enough. This is an inclusive growth play. But also this issue of climate. We have a huge potential here. And I want us to begin to switch the narrative. And I think this community, again, is vitally important. Because I worry about the climate personally. I worry about the climate emergency narrative. I would rather have a climate opportunity narrative. I would rather us talk about our incredible potential on our land base, the skills that we have, our oil and gas community, and many communities, our farming communities, have been in transition for some time. And I want us to talk up the upside of that. Because in doing so, a small country can take advantages of being small. We can position ourselves on the, on the globe as a place to invest. If you are interested in climate opportunity, then Scotland's a place you would be. If you are interested in transition from one technology to another, then Scotland is a place to be. And I want a level of confidence in our organisation, in our family, in our country, to recognise those opportunities. Because we should take advantage, being a small country, use our scale, again, as a comparative economic advantage. And what better chance than next year, when the world comes to Glasgow? I want us to be talking about the strides that we have taken, the clarity we have around our policy and our thinking and our resources to tackle some of these issues. And we should do that together. Thank you very much.